Well, now my my next move would be to uh, get rid of that knight by. Right, but remember what I said. You you want to see if anything is under under attack. Excuse. Me. Oh sh. Wonder. I didn't see that my bishop is in trouble on d d three. Now, but however, having said that, is it really under attack or not? All right. So, how has your journey been with chess? We haven't spoken um, since Pog Champs. Okay, so I got to be completely honest with you, right? Mm -hmm. oh. Pop champs, I'm like, dude, I've never played better chess. I'm feeling it. I got, I'm figuring it out. And I was dreaming about chess. I was analyzing all my games. And since then, I've still been like playing every day and yeah. I've gotten significantly worse, like significantly worse at just being like, oh, you want a queen? Here, take it. I don't need it. Take my queen. You know that? It's all like I'm going through the motions in a lot of ways, not analyzing in the right ways. I just mm -hmm. feel like my brain is not clicking okay. anywhere close to where it was. Really? Okay. Um, all right. Well, that's uh, that, that's good to know. Um, so what, what do you kind of want to look at, I guess, is the, sort of what I would ask, since we, we haven't, like, really done any lessons. I mean, like, we looked at, like, openings last time, like the Danish Gambit. So um, is it, like, middle games that you think your problems are, where, where the problems are occurring? Do you think it's, like, openings or yeah. kind of everything? So what's been happening for the most part is, mm -hmm. like I said, when I was playing Pog Champs, I had a plan. Like I could always have ideas and a plan in the middle game where I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, I'm trying to get to here. Yeah. And you know, now currently with, after some of my opens, I'm like, I don't know, I don't really see anything. You know, I don't, I don't really know where to go, go from here. Like, how do I make this an advantageous position? Okay. Um, just feeling a little mm -hmm. stuck in the middle game where, and, I'm, and then I'm just blundering like profusely. <laughs> all right. So then I guess, um, let, let me invite you to the sport. Just give me one second. There All right, are. so you said your problems are occurring in the middle game. So I think, again, since I, I don't know exactly what you've been playing or, or looking at, I think we should just start with just generic openings to, you know, get it into middle game and then discuss plans. So okay, well, what I've been doing is, mm -hmm. but I've, I've been using, well, for the most part, I've been using a Danish Gambit and then like a Knight or a Sicilian with black. But I've been also messing with, just screwing around, it got worse, like a, like a Scandinavian defense with black. And then I was doing like a Ponziani open for okay. with white, which was... You know, kind of interesting, but I, I got lost there too. Okay, so I guess then that's an interesting point to start. The Danish you can obviously look at many, many times, but I think that there are certainly issues with it. So I think let's let's take a look at this Ponziani opening. Um, so okay, so you can make moves here as well. So just so that I make sure you have the right the right right one. Okay. Mhm. Mm Knight here. Right. Perfect. So. Like now, what what is the reasoning? Do you know why you push this pawn to c3 exactly? Yeah, you're pushing that pawn to c3 to support a d4 push right. uh, and take the center. Exactly. So you, you kind of, if you get the pawns to e4 and d4, you want a lot of space. Like in a dream world, I'm just going to make a random move. If you get sort of a position like this, it's really, really good because like if black ever moves a knight, you can push a pawn. And then the knight kind of can't stay in the center because the knight covers a square. And like if the knight goes back, you can then push this pawn. Yeah. And basically the knights just get pushed back and you have all the space in the middle of the board and you're doing very, very well. Um, now the, the drawback, well not drawback, but but the kind of the, the issue with this, I guess, is what, what are your opponents playing against this move? Uh, well, I mean, at that level that I'm playing, you know, mm -hmm. they are making this, this uh, knight move. Then they're also just doing, they're pushing the pawn on d5 instead of the knight. Right. Um, they're not always bringing that knight out or, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so the danger kind of with this opening is that it requires very precise moves. Like, so for example, when Black pushes his pawn in the center, uh, do you, do you know what the correct move is here or not? I believe, um, I believe here it's to just take the pawn on e5 with uh, e4. Right now, that is actually the wrong answer. Um, oh. Okay. And, and that's why when I talk, like with this opening, you have to be very, very careful because the, the thing is, if you take this pawn on d5 here after black takes back, you're you're actually already a little bit worse here. Yeah. And the reason is because in this position, um, let's just say you push the pawn to d3, for example, black can now go bishop to f5, and let's just say you develop a bishop. Black can play well. Both moves are good, but let's just say black castles. And so you see this this pawn is already under a lot of pressure from the rook, the queen, and the bishop. Yeah. And in fact, you're gonna you're gonna end up losing material here. So um, you don't really want to push the pawn to d3. At the same time, let's just say you tried to develop the bishop here. Do you see what black's next move would be? 
Goran had one. Okay, so you moved your bishop to f2. What would black's next move be? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Black could. I imagine black, black could push the pawn to e4 and mm -hmm. attack the knight. Yeah, and you see now, um, if you move the knight to d4, black just trades and is up a pawn. Yeah. And if you don't put the knight on d4, like if you go to the very edge of the board, black can just play pawn here. And your knight is stuck. It actually, you just lose it. It's trapped. Mm -hmm. And then if you go back to g1, black can again just simply, there are many ways black can play this, but for example, black can just move the bishop out, attack the pawn. You're really struggling with development here. Yeah. Because all your pieces, you see like this pawn on c3 actually here is really bad. You would like to put your knight there to attack the queen. Mm -hmm. So the pawn's in the way, but also because this pawn is here, um, it, it creates a big problem because now like you, if you try to push this pawn black can play on Poisson. Yeah, and now this pawn is under attack Blue after you X capture back mm -hmm. Which in turn means that you have problems getting the stars for a bishop into the game You have problems developing this this knight on g1 your whole queen side is like everything is really stuck here You're already basically losing the game. Yeah So that's why um, if your opponent plays like this what you actually should play is you should now move your queen out Oh, how does that help? So the queen pins the knight, but... Mm -hmm. So, okay, so let's say I take the pawn. So yeah. the, the thought process when, when, you're, um, when you're trying to calculate different, different variations, it should be try to think of like three possible moves that you can play. Okay, so I could take the pawn on e5 with my knight. Mm -hmm. I could take the queen I, with, the, with the... Well, I mean, I don't really want to do that, but I could... I could mm -hmm. attack with the queen with e. Uh, I could e take the pawn with e4 right. uh, with the queen, and then the right. third thing I could do. Third thing I could do is I could. I don't know. I could theoretically. Yeah, there, 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 In in this case, there is no third move. Basically, you you have two options. I mean, there there is no third move. But what you want to be aware of is what are the moves that that kind of make sense. And in this position, there are only two moves that make sense. Now, which one do you think is better? Queen takes pawn or knight takes pawn? I think knight takes pawn because if I don't, then the, the knight is no longer pinned. Right. So, for example, if you play queen takes pawn, black can now move the knight out. Yeah. And black gains time because the knight is it's a developing move, but it also attacks your queen. And now let's say you move your queen away back to like a4. I can now just move my bishop here and castle. Yeah. And the pro you're actually going to have the same problem as in the other line. Let's just say you move your bishop here. After we castle... I can play e4 again because the knight supports the pawn. And if you move your knight to the center, I can move my knight here. And it might not look that bad, but what what is what's kind of the issue in this position for white? What is what what's what's the problem? There's several. One, I can't move my knight that's mm -hmm. trapped because of the pawn. Mm -hmm. um, um, like my my my, well, my yeah, I mean my bishop is also trapped in that same spot. Right. So, so like so, development, I'd say the major problem is development. It's hard exactly. to Exactly. Yeah. So like here, the problem is you really can't develop these three pieces because this pawn is in the way. Ideally, you'd like to put the bishop out and then bring the knight behind. But you can't do that because if you ever push a pawn, I just take the pawn and the knight's guarding the pawn. So that's yeah. why when you play this opening, you have to be very, very careful because you, you push this pawn to support the center. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can just end up lost immediately. Mm hmm so let's let's go back to this this position after pawn takes yeah the correct move is knight takes pawn and the reason is because i can't recapture but additionally you're still attacking the pawn but you're also threatening to take and win a pawn here. yeah so in this position normally what like if someone's experienced what they probably well let's just say okay let's just say takes knight takes so now here black kind of has two problems the pawn's under attack and the knight is also under attack because of the pit so now let's say black moves the queen to d5 here Again, getting back to this uh, the thought process, what are what are like two to three moves that you can think of that make sense? Okay, the first one is bishop to what is that c4, attack the queen. Mm -hmm. um, the other would be take the knight with my knight. Mm -hmm. is just subscribed. And then third option would be third option. I'm struggling to find a third option that would make any sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. With the third option, no, because then he can on Poisson. No, nope, right. that. Third option, I guess, would be to move the the pawn on c4 and just attack the 
the queen that way. I don't know. Well, one, one thing that you're so so I said think about a couple of options. Now the second thing that I would say is um, once you have a couple of moves, the second thing to, to pay attention to is is anything under attack here. What what is your opponent? Are, are any of your pieces under attack where they can be captured? Um, or they're unsupported on the squares that, they, that, that they're on. Oh, right damn now. it. My knight is, because if I, yeah, well, if I, yeah, so my knight is under attack. It's the double attack with the, their knight and the queen. Right. So you see the knight can't capture, but the queen can. The queen, queen is completely free to capture the knight. So that's sort of, you, you want to look for moves, and then you also want to see what is under attack. So in this situation, your knight's under attack. So this bishop move um, is actually not, not, not good, because I just take your knight. Yeah. So the, the, the best way to play this position would actually be to, to trade the knights. Because mm -hmm. now we, when you take, what happens if I take with my queen? Well, if you take with your queen, uh, I can do, I can pin your queen by bishop to b5. Yeah, and that's just winning the game because, of the, the, because I lose my queen. Here. Yeah. So this is very, very good. So now let's, let's say I take with the pawn here. Again, you see, you have one one kind of problem here. What you have the same problem as always, right? This this development issue. Yeah. So, um, again, let's let's try to go through this. What are is, first of all, is anything under attack here, or any of your pieces in danger of being captured where you aren't defending them? I don't see any. No. Okay. So nothing's under attack. So now that nothing's under attack, um, it's still the opening, right? So so what are a couple of moves? I mean, in in this case, just like what's what's your goal in the opening what do you want to do the the the, the basic concept well i want to develop my pieces and, right you know. exactly so if you're trying to develop your pieces um do you see i mean what what are a couple of ways of developing here well i see one which is you know to attack with the bishop on mm -hmm. c4 and then attacks the, the queen and maybe i win tempo with that move the other is like you know is, I mean, I could trade the queens and attack with the queen by moving it there, but that doesn't really develop. It just, well, actually it does develop because if he does trade, then I can pull my right. bishop up after. But I, I've always thought that when you're white, you don't want to trade as often if it's equal. And That's generally correct. Yes. I, I would say you, you would try to trade less. So, so the best move here is bishop to c4. Um, okay. Because first of all, it's a developing move. Secondly, attacks the queen. Uh, so you gain time. Your opponent has to waste time moving their queen. They can't just like move their knight and bishop and castle the king out of the center of the board. So all right, so I'm going to move my queen back to d7. So now in this position again, every, none of your pieces are under attack, obviously. Are you really attacking any of your opponent's forces here or not? Like, is there anything? Well, uh, I have the bishop that's attacking f7. Mm -hmm. But, but it that's is protected, protected right? by the queen. Yeah, that's protected by his queen. Mm -hmm. right. Right. So, um, so yeah. So in, in this position, since there's nothing really under attack, is there a way that you can continue to um, to finish your development? Well, I could castle right now, mm -hmm. which is something I'm gonna be doing, which is like my first thought, which would be to castle. Um, right. And the other option, I can't move that. Mm -hmm. That pawn on that pawn on D two is annoying because he's just I can't really move it. Um. Right. How do, how do we, so basically, I mean, I could, well, no, that doesn't work either. I mean, like I said, what I really see is castle. Right, which is it, that's that's the move you want to play. So let's say you yeah. castle, and now I'm gonna um, I'm gonna move my bishop out here. Okay, so now you're attacking. Now you're attacking. Well, h2, but I'm covered. Mm -hmm. Like my first thought would be to move my rook to e e1 right very good move any other moves other than e1 um I'm, i thought i think this one might be dangerous but like i thought of potentially uh f3 which i think you're not supposed to do right on uh, f3 in this situation it's actually a pretty reasonable move um is there is there are there any other moves that you can think of here I mean, rookie one is a good move. Are there any other moves I, you I, think? I, I mean, I think like there's something I usually like to line up with the Danish Gambit, which is, you know, get the queen to uh, b3 mm -hmm. and then really go at that. Square. Right. But again, if you move the queen to b3, you're really, I mean, the, the queen guards the pawn. So I'm just going to develop. Yeah. And you don't yeah. have any ways to attack the pawn because, again, what what's the issue? I don't have any ways to attack the pawn. No, no. I mean, what what is what is the fundamental issue in, in your position? Even here, there's the fundamental. I'm problem. I'm not I'm underdeveloped, and I can't right. I can't get out. I can't. Right. Yeah. Now, if you notice, though, there is a difference. Um, 
to the previous position, which is that here you're not losing material if you push this pawn. Which when I push the pawn d3? You, yeah, you can push the pawn to both squares. Um, I would actually say d3 is just just for the theme is, is much more important because now what happens is you can bring the bishop and bring the knight out very, very quickly. Oh, I see. Because he because when he put the bishop, it blocked the queen's attack. Exactly. Okay. So so now let, let's let, let's keep going with this. So bishop d6, d3. So now I'm just I'm going to take. And I would take back with my bishop. Very good. OK, and now let's say black moves the knight to f6 here. OK. Well, two options. I think I can, um, I can move my rook. I can check e1. Right. I can attack the knight with the uh, bishop on g5. Mm -hmm. I can. Oh, I can't move that queen. Those are the two moves. And right. Yeah, those two. I can't really think of a good start. So, so, so which which one? Okay. So now, like, which one? Which one kind of looks looks better to you? The one that looks better to me is getting my rook into check. Right. So this is actually very, very good because now, like, I can't castle my king because I'm in check. Um, now I can block with my bishop here. Let's say I block with my bishop. Okay. Well, now my, my next move would be to uh, get rid of that knight by... Right. But remember what I said? You, you want to see if anything is under, under attack. Is anything under attack? Is anything under attack? Hmm. See, this is sorry, by right. under by under attack, I mean it's sorry, is, is your opponent attacking any of your pieces? Jeez. Oh she wonder. I didn't see that my bishop is in trouble on D D3. Now, but however, having said that, is it really under attack or not? Like let's just say you, you move move your knight here. Just a random move and I take. Yeah. Seems like it is. I mean, I don't see a, I don't see a way to recoup that initially. So now again, if you remember the thought process, um, are any of your opponent's uh, pieces under attack? Is there anything that you can capture which is undefended? Well, I could, tr I could trade my rook for his bishop on mm -hmm. e7. Right, and that, that's just a bad trade because it's a rook for yeah. the bishop. That's bad. Yeah. I mean, I could attack his queen with my rook. All right. Which moves But remember, it. I said, is anything undefended? Anything that you can capture? Which, where, is there, are there any pieces that you can capture where your your, your piece won't be recaptured? Oh my God. C6, because I was thinking piece, but the, the, mm -hmm. the little pawn over there allows me to fork the, the rook in the corner. Right, so like if you take this pawn, you're actually just, you're, you're winning. Because even though you, you lost a bishop here, your yep. opponent's in check, and you capture the rook on the next turn. Yeah. So this is this is actually winning. I, again, the the point the point is that like you should always be looking to see what which, which piece of your opponent you can capture for free, and which piece of your own are not defended. That's I think more important. That that should be the first step, and then you start then you, then you look for like the two to three candidate moves that you can play. Yeah. Um, that's what I'm skipping. Like I don't know, my brain is just, it's like I, I I'm not I'm not I'm not doing things in the right order. Where right. I'm like, oh, I have these ideas. I have these. Ideas. I'm like, yeah, but you freaking have a hanging, you know, piece, and you didn't notice. Like, I, I'm not, I'm not playing, I guess, with a mentality right. of defensiveness at all. So, look, rookie one is a very good move, but just, just for a sort, sort of middle game ideas. Let's say you move your knight, black castles. Um, you move your knight here, and I'm just gonna randomly move my rook here. All right. So if we start, start kind of with this position. What are what are the what are the sort of the advantages that you have here in this position? Like, what, are, are there any advantages? By advantages, well, I mean like pawns, or do you like where yeah. your pieces are placed, or any of those? Sorts well, of I have a he has a hanging pawn on a seven. Mm -hmm. He's take queen. Right. Um, also, also Black, have, Black has two pawns here. He's got two pawns, and he's also he's his well his bishop is blocked in. Um, Mm -hmm. and, you know, cluttered, and my, my pieces are, you know, my diagonals are looking good with my two bishops towards the king, and right. I have my queen in a good position that can become offensive very quickly by swinging over the other side. Mm -hmm. um, everything I think is, everything on my end is protected. I have no vulnerabilities right now. Right. No, that's, that's very, very good. So now, now that you've established, like, you have a really good bishop here. Black also is a bishop, by the way. Um, and black has pawns that are not not as great. Furthermore, the bishop can't be developed. So you are you are significantly better here. Um, let me play 
one more move just to get to this position. Um, so why do you think I push this pawn to c5 here? To attack that queen and force me to queen, possibly to win some tempo. Correct. Now, now let's just say you you move your queen away. What what else does this this move accomplish? Do, do you see any sort of reason that I push this pawn? Well, it. I guess the first thing I can think of is it doesn't allow my knight to get to uh, d4 anymore. Mm -hmm. So it protects that square d4. True. Very true. Is um, there any any other reason or any, anything else you can see with this pawn push that, that it allows black to do? Well, the other thing, it, it creates a space for, for the queen. Right. Uh, so so what, what, I'm, what I was trying to highlight with this move is that the one is one of the, the biggest issue for black here is this bishop on c8 because the queen is in the way so you can't really develop this bishop um and, and you're probably going to need these rooks connected and in the center because there are two open files you see like right, right the e file and the d file they're not completely open but they're only they're the only really open files there's a b file as well but it's not not really important at the moment so when i push this pawn what i'm doing is i'm actually opening up a diagonal for my bishop because I can't really develop it this way, but if but if I can push this pawn and get the bishop um, bishop to v7, it's very effective because because then I have two bishops lined up on both the diagonals towards the white king. Yeah, that's actually a good sort of thing that just epiphany I had of like when someone makes a move that I'm like, well, what's that? You know, mm -hmm. if it doesn't seem like it's a big deal, like trying to figure out like, well, why did they do that? And that right. will help me, I think, like avoid just these, you know, big blunders that I made because I didn't notice right like what the purpose was but there it's you know it's quite obvious yeah like this allows their bishop to have a nice diagonal rather than the other things i said right so so like okay so now so if we look at this position um if you move the queen back here and i get this bishop here do you think you're better or you're worse um i th i mean i think i'm better still I think all I'm right better so still. Is there so again? Let's get back to the thought process. Is there is there anything that's really um, that you're attacking that you can capture for free, where your opponent can't recapture it? Not right now. Okay. Is your opponent attacking anything um, where where like you, you'll you'll lose material? I don't see any immediate ones. No. Okay. So immediately no. But let's just say you you push this pawn. Okay. And I take this knight. Mm -hmm. Do you That's see what's... Problem. Yeah. Why, why is it a problem? Well, I have to take that back, and now I leave my king vulnerable to an attack by that that queen, yeah. Right, and you're actually basically getting checkmated here at this point. Yes. Yeah. So if, if I can get this position where the bishop, bishop is here, and I, I have the two bishops lined up towards where your king is, it's actually really quite dangerous. Um, now, white is better here. There's still a move besides besides trading the queens or retreating. Um, so in this position, the one thing you, you the one thing that you have here is you you have a much more active queen mm -hmm. relative to black queen. I mean the rest of the pieces are pretty normally placed. I wouldn't say either side is much of an advantage here. Can you think of any other moves with your queen besides trading and retreating that perhaps make some sense? Well, again, like part of what I think of is, you know, being a pawn muncher and there's one free pawn available on a seven, but it feels like that, you know, gives me a material advantage. It doesn't do much else for me in terms of development. Are there any, any other squares you can think of moving the queen to? Um, ah, yeah. How about H four? Right. Now this is actually a very, very good square because what happens is now, now like your, your bishop and your queen are, are aiming at this H seven pawn. Mm -hmm. And much more importantly as well is that now the concept, you, you know what removing the de defender means, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's only one defender of h7. Now if we go back here and you play queen c2, bishop b7, you'll see how these bishops are really, really good and black is attacking. Whereas your bishop on c1, it's kind of okay. You can put it on g5 at some point, but it's not really as effective. Now, if you put the queen over here on h4, um, what, what would your next move be if I just play a random move? Um, well, I mean, I have two, I have one idea is to move my pawn to g4 and then attack the, move the knight on the next, the next turn. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So, so if you, if you move your bishop here, you're threatening to remove the defender of the one pawn and there's just a checkmate, um, on h7. 
Oh, I was going to do it the wrong way, though. Oh. I said the G4 with the pawn. Oh, sorry. I, I mis Oh, I misunderstood you. Okay, sorry. You were going to say G4. Yeah, you could play G4, but actually the real problem with playing G4 here is that after Bishop B7, do you, do no, you see no. what the problem is? Yeah, well, now I have to defend that knight. Right. And, and also, now since you've pushed the pawn, if you say move your knight away, I can do this. Oh, boy. <laughs> and it's, it's really, really bad. Like, suddenly your king is very open yeah so you really don't you, you don't want I, I would say like almost never like in almost no situation unless it's like at least you're like 30 moves in do you ever really want to say push the pawn in front of your king here when you've castled it i would say like just don't even like even if you think about it don't play it yeah um because if you move your bishop here this is actually really really good because in one go you threaten to remove the knight and you also don't weaken these pawns around your king much better yeah yeah so now, after this move, um, I, I obviously can't move the knight because it's checkmate, right? So, what would you do if I pushed my pawn here? Again, I would, uh, mm -hmm. I would make the exchange anyway. I would take the knight. Mm -hmm. And after I take back, now I'm, now I'm pushing my queen. I'm taking on h6. Mm -hmm. Yep, and you threaten checkmate in one. Exactly. Yeah. So. In this position, it's already really, really hard for um, Black to play. In fact, White is almost just winning. It is, I mean, I mean, sorry, White is just winning here because Black can't really do anything about this knight. No. So what's happened here is like basically, if we go, if we go back to this very start, where where did this all start going the right way for you? At what point did everything turn around? Or when did you start? Well, it turned. It started to turn when I was able to move that pawn on d2 and start my development exactly yeah so that's probably the most important thing with this opening is that when you push this pawn to c3 very early you need to find a way to get the push this d pawn because if you if you don't know exactly what you're doing you don't get to push this pawn you're you end up in a lot of trouble i would um, say 90 more than 90 percent of the time i'm able to just push d4 uh mm -hmm. immediately after uh c3 yeah, okay, so yeah, so th th that's what I was going to say, is if your opponent does isn't really sharp and they don't push this pawn in the center, let's just say they develop their knight here. Yeah. W what is your next move? To push d4. Very good, right. And so now um, there, there are a couple different moves black can play. Black can obviously, I mean, take the pawn, but, but sort, sort of for middle game purposes, let's just say I push my pawn to d6. They do that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, my typical move here is to push d5. Okay, now in this this position, that's actually not how you want to play this because right now you have this big center, so you have a lot of space. Mm -hmm. you, you have much more space than your opponent. Mainly, the main the main way I would look at it is that your bishop, for example, can go to c4, and the black bishop cannot go to c5. The black bishop is is um, let's just say bishop c4, bishop b7. The bishop is inside the pawn chain. I magically would like to put this bishop over here on b6, for example, rather than being on e7 because it's it's just stuck behind the pawns. Now, it doesn't mean like it's a terrible piece or anything, but it's not really very active. Yeah. Whereas your light square bishop on c4 is extremely active here. Yeah. So many people probably will play this. Now, the thing that happens is if you push this pawn, your opponent probably will move their knight back. And now let's just say you play normal developing moves, and I move my pawn, castles, bishop g7. Um... The problem long term with playing an opening like this is that if your opponent knows what they're doing, even though you have more space, do you know what the King's Indian opening is? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so I'm just gonna make make um, sort of normal moves here, rookie one, like h3. Basically, the problem becomes that what happens is even though you have more space here, sort of on the queen side, like you can push push a lot of pawns here and move your knight out, your opponent is gonna attack very quickly on the king side, which is where your king is. Yeah. So, for example, let's just say c4, f5, knight c3. They play, like, pawn to h6. I think what I did was I was confusing an idea, which included, you know, d5 being crucial to somehow later getting my queen to a4 and my uh, bishop to f5 and then just overloading the square on c6. Like, that's, mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I had this idea that I could get there and then I could get, like, a fork with uh, the knight, or oh, sorry, with the, with the rook and the... And the the king but i think that's not available in from this setup it's right different... no it, it's completely different yeah so like what, what i would say is like if your opponent plays like this um the simplest way to play is to develop uh develop and protect your center so you move your knight here 
So because basically what you're really hoping for is that your opponent will trade pawns and you get this really nice center. You get this control um, because if your opponent ever pushes, you can take more space in the center by pushing your pawn. So black can't really contest the center. You see, like if black could take, let's just say, you know, I could I could randomly set up a position like this. If I can get my pawn to c5, I can sort of try to contest the center a little bit. But when we look at this position, if I, if I try to contest the center or, or, you know, make you have to do something with these pawns, you actually just push the pawn. And after yeah. knight here, you take, you have much more space again. Yeah. Now, mind you, it's not like this is winning or anything. And I'll, I'll try to try to explain more, but let's, but let's, let's get back to sort of this position. So this is a dream. You're hoping your opponent takes. Yeah. Now let's say your opponent develops the bishop. I, I, I used to hate when they took. <laughs> Okay, so, so you want mm -hmm. so, okay oh sorry yeah so so like here in this position um you have this really nice center your knights knights are very well placed they defend the defend the pawns in e4 and d4 so now you want to finish your development so what square do you think your bishop can be best placed on you, you have three squares basically you have um this one you have this one and you have this one well, the most, the, well, there's, yeah, that's, so it's an interesting one because I always know that there's some value in pinning the knight, but it feels like it's more active if I put it on C4. Right. Now, potentially it can be. The, the thing is, in this position, bishop D3, I would say, is the best move. And the reason is that if you put the bishop on C4, I can now take the pawn and push my pawn. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's bad. And, and the reason this is actually bad is because you end, it, it's not like losing or anything, but it's not it's not great because you no longer really have control of the center. You only have one pawn in the center. You don't have two pawns. Yeah. And so you end up in a situation where you actually have this isolated pawn, which what that means is that there are no pawns next to it. You, you have no pawns like on the C2 square or the E2 square that can move up and support the pawn. It's just a lone pawn because all your pawns are too far away to support support that pawn on D4. Yeah. So your center, you, you're, you're not losing or anything but it's not really what you want so that's why here you actually put the you should put the bishop on d3 so what does it do there really well it's first of all it's about developing the bishop um but there is a long-term plan which is if you see this knight on d2 this is not really where you want your knight for the whole game because at some point you want again you want you want to move this bishop and get the rook in the game but the knight's in the way of the bishop here Mm -hmm. right so so what the bishop does is of course you're still going to develop but at some point you can move this knight to like b3 or to f1 and you can bring your bishop into the game because this bishop oh, I see. So it's protecting on on e4 i was wondering what it was doing but yeah right I so it. i mean this it's not like it's not obvious why why it's the best move again it's it's pr this is pretty kind of advanced in terms of why this is the best move but the reason is that at some point the knight knight's in the way of this dark square bishop and you want to bring it out so the point is that you want to move the knight and you, you want to move the knight and your bishop will support the pawn um, also, again, your opponent cannot really attack in the center. Let's say you trade and try this. What would your next move be here? Uh, from here, I take space by pushing e5. Right. And now, again, your opponent can't move the knight here because your knight and your bishop cover the square. Mm -hmm. So you'll end up ahead um, by one pawn. And if your opponent moves the knight, now do you see why the bishop is so good here? I mean, it's not like there's a move, but does do you, do you understand why this bishop is so much better here than, like, on b5, for example? Because... It's kind of, well, I mean, now it has a nice diagonal on... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that diagonal. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's actually, like, I, I phrase that a little bit badly, but basically the bishop is really well placed. So that when both sides, um, let's just say we both castle, uh, this bishop is, is always targeting this pawn on h7. Mm -hmm. Now, again... The way that you would proceed to try and um, play this position is it's very kind of slow, which is you you would move this rook. So what, can you think of any logical, well, not logical, but any reason I would move this rook um, from that square on F1? Well, I always think it's just best to have it, um, you mm -hmm. know, not doing anything on F1 at all. And now it sort of continues to support the center and it yeah. supports mm -hmm. on, on uh, e5 if i ever want to push the pawn forward like if right. i push the pawn forward now he has to take back and now he opens up a little bit of vulnerability from his, on his king yeah very that that's absolutely correct there's also another reason and this is sort of why you put the bishop on d3 the other reason that you move this rook is so that you can you can reroute your knight here so let's just say i move my knight you can actually now play knight to f1 yeah 
And uh, let's just say I move my bishop out here. You can move. You can move your knight. Yep. And what, what's do, do you do you kind of see where I'm trying to move my knight from g3 versus like where it was on d2? Do you see? Do you know what the point of having a knight on g3 in this position where you want to put this knight? Um, well, I mean, I'm thinking you want to set it up so it attacks the pawn on g7. Mm -hmm. I do that, but I don't. I think it's typically not good to put it on the side of the board. So you, you're trying to get it to uh, f5. Yep. yep, that's that's absolutely correct. Um, yeah. Like I don't know. Uh, probably this hasn't been said, but if you can get a knight to this this f5, so let me just make a random move. If you can get this knight to f5 here, um, especially where your opponent can't capture a knight, and you have a king with pawns like on these three squares, or even if black has like this structure of pawns, the knight is very very strong. What do I do if he just pushes his pawn on g6? Right, so if he pushes his pawn on g6 here, what, what you do is you actually trade the knight for the bishop. And the reason you do this is because your opponent has weakened the king. He's pushed his pawn like this, and wh whenever you have the structure that's uh, the Fion Keto structure, basically, you always want this bishop in front of the king, but there's no bishop on this square. So it, it's a, it's a, it, the dark squares are very weak now because you, you, you just lost your bishop. Now I would want to get my bishop to so eight. take with the queen. What's, okay, so now, I don't know, I always think that like it's a good thing to have my bishop move to h6 where it's mm -hmm. deadly over there. Right, now that's a good move. Um, but there there is a theme here, actually, which is when your opponent has a structure, whether it's a pawn or a bishop, uh, there is a way to try to create a checkmating pattern with the bishop on a, putting the bishop on a different square. Can you think of another square you can put the bishop on besides h6? Yeah, I could put it on, you know, g5. Right. Now let me move my queen here. And I'll, I'll make the next move. Let's say let's say I put the bishop here. Okay. Does the bishop look very strong or not on this this uh, this f6 square? Um, it looks incredibly strong. It's protected by the pawn, and there's no pawns that can attack it. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's kind of like it's almost like an outpost for the bishop, where where nothing can remove the bishop from the square. Now, the thing that I want you to sort of keep in mind here is when you see the structure of the pawns. So right now, black black has no dark square bishop to sort of counteract your bishop on the dark squares. So you're suggesting and it makes sense. Like I'm all I've I've been typically thinking about getting the bishop to the side rather than mm -hmm. instead of like going to h6, it's much better or it's much better on f6. Now it depends again on sort of where the pawns end up, but sort of this is a common theme that you'll start seeing in your games more and more. Like if your opponent pushes a pawn in front of their king and they end up with three pawns like this and they don't have a bishop in front, like you always want to have a bishop here. You want to have something here if you're gonna play like this. So for example, if we go back, let me um let me make some random moves. Uh, let's let's just say we get some position like this. Now, if you look at this position, this this is still actually quite good for white. But you see how this bishop is sort of it takes away you know sort of the threats this this bishop would have on f6 otherwise because there's yeah. a bishop on g7 here. So I can obviously just trade, but you see it's it's going to be hard to attack because like even in this position your knight can't go anywhere the pawn stops it and um, like. I don't know, let's just say you move your queen. You get some position like this. White is white is better, but it, there isn't a clear-cut plan for how to attack towards the black king. Where I get to sometimes, both with that opening and whatever, is like, all right, all my pieces are in a good spot, it looks like, mm -hmm. but all the little squares that I want to get to to finish the game are unavailable. Right, so, okay, so let's let's go back to um, uh, to, to this position after queen e7 here, the bishop f6. So I am going to play, let's just say I, I, I move my bishop to f5, for example. So you can obviously make a trade, but can you kind of think of a way to try to checkmate this black king here? Checkmate the black king from here. All right, let me think about that. Because um, right now the answer would be no. Mm -hmm. but, um, so this is this is a pat. Basically, this is a pattern here. Okay, I, I don't know. I, I was thinking attack, like. Hmm. I was okay, thinking... so I'll, I'll give you the first move. So let's just say you move the queen here. Okay. So let's say I take your bishop. Yeah, I don't even... I'll just let him have it, and I just go to uh, h6, right? Yeah, and this is just a force checkmate. Yeah. Because black has nothing to guard... guard, guard. I mean, to defend against the checkmate on g7. You have no dark square bishop. Like, this is why, generally, if your opponent pushes this pawn and you're able to have a dark square bishop... Or even a pawn, for that matter. This this mating pattern is very common. Yeah. 
So that's that's why actually if we go back, that's why G6 is such a bad move because what happens is if you're aware of a situation like this where you have a dark square bishop or even a pawn for that matter, if you can get like a pawn or a bishop to this square, there always are going to be ideas where you can bring a queen down and check me. Yeah. Um, so then just to finish this up, let's just say I move my knight back. So what would your next move be? Well, my next move would still be uh, H H6. Mm-hmm. So now let me move the knight to stop the checkmate. Oh shit. Um, then I think I would uh, trade bishops. You can, yeah, you can do that. That's fine. Um, oh, I guess that didn't accomplish anything. Well, I guess it did. Well, yeah, it did. So now I would move my knight to g5. Mm hmm. And black can't actually stop checkmate. Can't stop it, right? Because if I take the knight, you checkmate here. Yep. Yep. And if I don't take the knight, you're just taking. So even if I move my rook, you just take and the knight guards the queen, and that's just checkmate also. So I could have done that without swapping bishops. Yeah, you, you could have done that without swapping bishops, but it, I mean it's not it's not it's not really that important. But the thing is that it's th this this idea of getting like uh, the bishop and the queen or having a pawn and a queen with a checkmate idea is really really important, and it's why you'll very rarely see. Um, you'll you'll want you probably you'll notice like almost everybody they get some position like this when they cast on the king side almost everybody plays like this and the reason yep. is because if you're not careful and you and like in this position you push this pawn to remove the knight you can you basically end up uh, losing the game because of the dark squares dark square bishop and and black has no dark square bishop to counteract the, the threats and like even let me just show even more like let's just say we reach this position again and now I move the knight back. So, what would your next move be? Well, let me let me make a random move just so it becomes simpler. What would your next move be here? My next move here would be to move my queen to d2. Mm -hmm. All right, so now I'm going to take. Okay, now I would just uh, take back the knight. Mm -hmm. Let's say I take the pawn. And now I go h6. Right, and again, it's the same thing. Like, I can move my knight back, but you just take the knight. And that's why this is this is kind of what I'm saying. If there's a structure where your opponent gets pawns like this and they don't have a bishop, a dark square bishop around their king, the checkmating pattern is very, very common. Um, so it, it's really important to keep that in mind. Now, let's just say I move my king over. I would still move h6. Right. And when I go rook over to stop the checkmate. Then I would uh, go knight to g5. Right, and and again, there's no way to stop the checkmate. The pawn and the queen prevent the rook from moving up, and otherwise it's just checkmate with queen takes pawn. So it's it's really important to um to be aware of this idea. If your opponent tries, if there's a situation where you have like a dark square bishop and your opponent has pawns around their king like this, if if your opponent has these three pawns and they have no bishop to defend the king, if you can get like a bishop or you can even get a pawn up there, it's very, very dangerous, if not. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but like what facilitates all that and makes it possible for the most part is having a pawn that's protected on E5. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And that's why if you once we get to this position, it's really, really good. That's why normally your opponent, they will try not to, um, tr they try not to concede the center and trade the pawn. Because again, there's always a lot of danger that, that at some point, whether they push or even if they leave the pawn, at some point you might even be able to push and open up this diagonal. So that's why the center is so, so critical um, in this opening. Yeah. So, okay, so let's say they castle, and now you castle. Um, now I'm just gonna play rook e8. It's a very, I think, logical move. What What is the reason, what does it make, Make why, why do you think I move my rook over to e8 here? Well, I, it's not doing anything on f, f8, and also, I think, um, I mean, maybe this is a crazy idea, but it protects from this move where like the bishop's on h6 and the queen is attacking. And then like, basically- Yeah, that's true, right? If you could get a queen to like g3 or something, you could put a bishop, that's true. Um, so yeah, it yeah. definitely avoids that. Secondly, in this situation, also black can move the bishop out of the way and try to attack this pawn on e4. Yeah. So now here, um, let's just say, you Okay, let's say you play h3. What, why do you think I played h3 here? I mean, I create space for my king, but is there another reason I push the spawn? So you don't allow the bishop to attack on g4 or the knight on... 
Exactly. That's... Yeah, basically, you, you don't want this bishop to get to g4. Now, I played an incorrect order. Actually, the way that you should play this is right here, you should play h3 to stop it. Because, um, you know, when you castle, your opponent could do this. And when you play push the pawn, if they take, you take back. And you're still guarding your center here. Yeah. Also, note the bishop on d3 really important because the pawn is protected. Uh, but after h3, if they move their bishop back, you really have this problem to deal with, which is if you just try to play rookie one, they can take and take back the pawn. And this pin, you end up losing one pawn here. Or you can end up losing your queen. Yeah. So you, you kind of want to prevent that. So let, let's just say, um, let, let me just start with the correct order. So let, oops, go. So here, bishop d3, rookie eight castles. Um, so now I'm going to move my bishop out of the way because I maybe I want to look to open up the center of the board. So now here, rookie one is the best move. And uh, it, first of all, it, it defends the pawn. Because for example, let's just say you move your knight. What can black do here? He can uh, take on e on d4. Right. And then what happens when you capture back? Now he can take the the pawn on e4. Exactly. Now you're, now you're actually behind by a pawn again. Yeah. So that's why you want to move your rook here to start with. Now... Let's just say I move my bishop. You, you've definitely, you've completed all your development on the king side. Your bishop is very well placed on d3. Your knight on f3 is good. Uh, you've, you're never getting back rank because you push the pawn. Your rook is, is relatively good on e1. So what is the one issue you have here still? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I don't know. My thought process is like, knight to f1 and get it to g3 absolutely that, that's very good that you remember that from the previous position that's exactly what you want to do here and um one second uh and the, the kind of the point here is that in in this position um like you know you want to put the knight on g3 uh but you also want to develop your bishop here mm -hmm. so Let's say in this position, um, I'm not really sure what uh, what what blacks, you know, what what can black really do here? Um, I mean, I black usually when you have, I mean, when I have like no idea, just bust shit up in the middle. Right, but can yeah, so takes, but now you take back. And again, black can't really attack in the center of the board here because your pawn on e4 is supported by the bishop and the rook, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your knight also guards this pawn. Black doesn't have this move either to try and undermine the pawn on d4 here. Um, so in, in this position, it's very, very hard for black to play because black has no space. If he tries to contest the center with his pawn push, you just push your pawn forward. Um, and and you're just going to develop your knight, and then you can move your bishop out to like g5 or push, push your pawn to e5 next move. So this position is really, really good for you. I'm just going to make some random moves what would your next move be after a6 i would go bishop g5 now that that is one way of playing here um but in this case your bishop is on, on d3 and attacking towards h7 here um so the better move would be to play knight to g3 well that's what yeah i, I forgot that was the order that one then i was thinking well, about bishop. There, there is there is one issue though because like now if i push my pawn and um and if I go bishop g5, you can now play pawn to h6 here. Yeah, that's bad. And you'd really love to keep this pin alive of the knight and the queen. But if you go bishop h4, black can play pawn to g5. Yeah, that's bad. And now your bishop gets trapped because you have a knight. You can't retreat your bishop anymore. Yeah. So let, let's just say say b5 is played here. Um, now you, you have this like perfect development where your knights are really well placed. They, they again guard the pawns. Uh, maybe you can go knight f5 at some point, but this is where uh, this is where like trying to find a, trying to find a way to really attack and t make make take advantage of the fact that you have the center of the board here. Um, so you can develop your bishop, obviously that's completely fine. Are there any other options here for like ways to try and attack in the center of the board? Well, the other, I mean, I, I think this is a potentially a mistake, but like, what about like pawn to D five. Did you say D or E? D. D. Okay. Now that that is wrong. The 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 moves that you want to play here, the the reason that actually so so like now let's let's say you push the pawn and the knight comes here. 
If you yeah. look at this bishop on d3, there are pawns in front of it. The bishop has no kind of like no scope here, right? Yeah. Towards this pawn at h7 anymore, because now like now you, you can't push this pawn, cause, and and so the bishop it's still not a bad piece, but it's not as effective anymore because this diagonal is closed. The bishop is blocked by the pawn. Yeah. So a better move here is actually to push the pawn to e5. Okay. Yeah, I guess I didn't see that's the thing. Sometimes I didn't. I don't do the calculation to notice that it's still. Mm -hmm. I still have protectors. Well, it, it has, kind of it, it's it more it's more like the protection the protection of the pawn is important, but it's more about the theme. Like you see this bishop, it's an open diagonal. Yeah. So now let's say I move my knight here. I, I'm pretty sure you haven't heard of this, but there's a, there's a term in chess called the Greek gift. Greek gift. Yeah. I have heard of it, and I'm trying to remember what the hell it was, and I don't. Okay, so like in this position, what you can do here is you can actually play bishop takes pawn on h7. Yeah. And you can do that because... Let's say I take the bishop. Now I attack with my queen on queen to d3. Now you can play queen to d3, but now I will just retreat my king back to g8 oh. here. So so how do I attack the queen then? Or the, 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 the king? Okay. So let's see. Um, now, besides what's under attack and what's being defended, there's another thing you should always be looking for, which is checks. So how, right. how many checks do you have in this position? I have the check on uh, G5, knight to G5. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so knight to G5 is actually the, the best move here. So knight to G5, and um, let's say I move my king back. Well, I mean, I, I can't take the knight because obviously you recapture the bishop. So let's say I move the king back to G8 here. Okay, now I move my queen to h5. Very good. And I don't really have a way to stop uh, stop the checkmate on h7 here. Because I'd, I'd love to put the bishop on f5, but then you can very simply capture it. Mm. Um, so there's no way for me to stop checkmate here. I'm, I mean, I can give up the queen and keep the game. The game will keep going for a little bit longer. Um, but it's, it's just black is completely lost here. Yeah. So that's why, actually, when you put this bishop on d3 very early on, you're just like, well, you know, what, what is the bishop really doing? But it's actually, there, there are many reasons you put it here. One is obviously to, to guard the pawn so you can reroute your knight. Secondly, if the diagonal opens up again, you always have these ideas with e5 and knight g5 and bishop h7 with queen h5 here. So really, like, there's value in the short term for protection of the pawn, but really it's all about the long-term value of just having exactly. that diagonal that, that may open up as the game develops. Right, exactly. So, so that that's why it's sort of it. It you know, in the short term, you're like, uh, what's the bishop really doing? But, but black kind of runs out. It runs out of time in a way because let's just say we reach this position. And um, I'm trying to think of another way I could play this. Let's say I push my pawn to b5 here. Okay. So, like now, now it's, it's very hard, right? Because you you can't really you see like I'm not letting you get this open diagonal. We both of these two pawns. So like, if you take, I just take back, and the diagonal is closed permanently. Yeah. Um. So, like in a position like this, now what you can kind of try to do is you can play something like bishop to g5, and you're creating this pin towards um you know towards towards the queen on d8. And then I would imagine he would move his bishop to e7. That's that's a reasonable move, yeah. And so now. What is the best way to play this? Um, it's it's very hard because it's a very closed position. That's kind of one of one of the tricky things. So it's a lot of you know when there there aren't many exchanges on the center of the board. And it's very closed. All the pieces are on the board this late. Uh, it's a lot of the game is about maneuvering your pieces here. Um, so like in, in this position, like if if you're if you're white, what what do you which piece is not developed yet? Which piece is not developed yet? Well, I mean, my bishop is blocked in still because it's not screwed on that right. diagonal. But, but I mean, by developed, I mean, it's, it's it's you have put it on a square. Even if it's maybe not looking so great right now, you have moved it to a developing square. Well, I mean, the rook on a1 has moved. Right. So where would you, I mean, where would you like this rook to be? I mean, like on this next move or just in general? Or like Just, in, just oh. in general, just in general. I wonder if... Does it do anything on C3? Um, you could. Now, if you if you look at this position... I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. Sorry. No, go ahead. 
I meant C1, not C3. Yeah, no, that, that's fine. But, but like, so you could put the rook on C1, but the problem with the rook on C1 is the only way it becomes active is if, if I trade the pawns. And then you have a then you have a great file with the rook on C1 here. Yeah. Um, but that, that requires me playing along and, and taking this pawn in the center. If I don't take the pawn, the rook kind of, it's, it's behind this pawn on C3. Mm -hmm. And you're not, you're not really ever pushing the pawn. Cause like, I, I mean, if I just make some moves, you're, you're always going to lose the pawn in the center. Like this pawn on C3 is sort of, it's this pawn chain from B2 to D4. This is where it, like, it holds it all together. Like, this is where I get stuck. I'm like, all right, well, what next? And I don't have a move. And then I just say, oh, typically when I don't have a move, I just bust stuff up. Right. Now, so, so like, again, everything is pretty well placed here, but what you want to do is you, you would want to move your queen forward. Yeah. And well, let's, let's just say I make a random move. So where, where do you have any idea why I moved my queen to D2? Well, so, it, you know, there's the diagonal with the bishop. Mm -hmm. um, do you see where you can put the rook now, though? Which row? I mean, the one on A1? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Does it now all of a sudden, does it help? I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, so you, the reason that you like you put it on D1 is because now now you have the chance to bust everything up where you can open the position and your rook is going to be on open file. You see, if black ever trades the pawns, you're the one who's going to you're going to open this, this E file. But you're also now threatening where you can trade the pawns and play on this file. So you see, want like, your rooks to get on that? open files. Something like that, a calculation like that is like not something I'm typically very good at is seeing, you know, like, because mm -hmm. that's, yeah, there's just like, okay, well, what, I'm thinking about like, what does this rook do now? And then it's like, actually, it helps, but it helps like four moves from now. Yeah, no, I mean, th it's a, this is a, this is why actually I find this opening very difficult because like the, the general, what happens in closed positions is you have to do a lot of maneuvering of your pieces. It's, it's very difficult, um, which is why like I think open positions are better. Um, so, but, but the point kind of is that what you want to remember is rooks are always really good on open files. Um, and at some point you, you, you don't mind, like if a position gets kind of stuck like this, where everything is kind of closed and there, there aren't open files, you want to see if there are ways that you can create open files, but then you can put the rooks on those open files to attack. Yeah, that makes sense. I just, it was very difficult to see that one. Um, mm -hmm. then for, for someone like me to see that that's something that will happen down the road. Yeah, I mean, that's that's actually kind of why, like, I don't love this opening in general, because, like, it, it, it is a good opening that you can play, but again, it because it becomes very closed very quickly, it's very hard to play. Um, yeah, it closed the way I was playing it. <laughs> the way I was playing it, it wasn't really that close. Right, well, again, I mean, I guess, you know, what I would say is, that, let's just say your opponent plays d6 here, so you have some idea of what you can do. If you want to sort of try to play this in a more open way, you can move, maybe move your bishop out right away to b5. So, I mean, I need to play the open. I prefer, I mean, I have a lot more comfort with Danish Gambit anyway. I just mm -hmm. thought, you know, because what I learned in Pog Champs was that, like, in these tournament formats, um, having one open that's tricky, if people mm -hmm. figure out how to play against it, it's no longer tricky and it's not all that good. <laughs> right. That That's kind of the danger with playing playing Gambits is if your opponent knows what to do against them, in many cases, they don't work. Um I do have another suggestion though, which is you can also play this uh, Scotch opening as well against uh, against this knight out where you can push the pawn, which I, I also kind of like because what happens is let's say Black takes the pawn. Uh, actually, let's just say this, this is um, you can move your bishop to c4. So that's called the Scotch. It's called the uh, the Scotch Gambit. Yeah, I should and try actually, that. In in this one. The difference is kind of it's it's a lot harder for your opponent to push the pawn. So for example, um, let's just say black moves the knight. Remember, this is a gambit. You've given up a pawn, so it's very similar to the Danish. The only difference is you haven't yeah. pushed the pawn and given up the second pawn on. Right, C3. so I would be pushing e5. Right. Okay. And now, if your opponent is really strong, and let's just say they know to play this pawn push, it's very similar to the the Danish, um, where this pawn push is playable. There is a difference here. Because you haven't given up a second pawn, you're only down one pawn here. You can now move your bishop up. And when they move this knight here to, to get out of the threat, you can take with your knight. Oh, because now the, the knight that takes back is pinned. Right. And so let's just say I, I move my bishop here. You can now 
take with a bishop uh normally black will take with a pawn they, they can take with the bishop too um but let's just say they take with a pawn so now let's just castle the king say i move the move the bishop here you're gonna push the pawn here D don't, don't worry about the specific moves but it's just for a theme so let's say i move the knight you push the pawn they castle and now you push this pawn to f5 do you, do you see what i'm trying to do with my pawn yeah you're trying to get your pawn to the little house the king's house and, and move that pawn in, in on g7 exactly that's that's exactly what i'm trying to do so for example let's just say i play a move like bishop to g5 and now you push the pawn yeah the one where the other if it moves forward it opens up that other opportunity we talked about right and if, and if mm -hmm. it takes it's open either way yeah so this is kind of the thing i was going to say is if you can get even if you, it's not a bishop for example see black has not moved any of these pawns on the original off their original squares on f7 g7 or h7 these three pawns have not moved but but again because you have the pawn supporting the pawn let's just say i move my rook over do you do you see any way again to try and create checkmates or try to attack near where the king is uh it feels like queen to g5 is a ding ding right because if if i move my knight back then i take with my knight right and if i push the pawn then i go to h6 yeah and it's the same it's the exact same pattern now it yeah. came about in a very different way but it's the same pattern with the checkmate because black has no dark square bishop so this notion of like getting the bishop or getting a pawn to the square and creating this checkmate pattern is very it, it's very important because you will see it happen quite frequently yeah so what, what i would say actually is if you want if you want to play more open sort of i think actually you should look at the um you should probably look at the scotch gambit versus um versus the ponziani um as an opening now let's just say here just just to sort of give some other other opportunities let's just say black push puts the bishop on c5 here okay so now i could do could i move i mean i see a attack if i move the knight to g5 yeah you could do that actually what you do here is you kind of, it's kind of an inverted order you now play pawn to c3 hmm so like the the difference and this probably it probably makes no sense at all is like if you push the pawn we take and you go like bishop c4 this is the danish yeah they can now push the pawn to d5 yeah um it's maybe not in this maybe actually knight f6 e5 d5 is simpler but you, you've given up two pawns along the way and um and black is black is probably better here but if we go back to this other order with bishop c4 bishop c5 c3 the difference is black has put the bishop here versus the knight being here so you kind of you end up in the same situation except black doesn't have the black's knight isn't here they, they've accidentally put the bishop on c5 okay and so like let's just say something like this happens you can now take this pawn oh i see and then he has to take back mm -hmm. and then, I, then I, my queen goes to uh d5 right and now after king to f8 now i take his knight i mean take his bishop mm -hmm. exactly and black can probably move the queen here and you end up in a position like this where it's even material but black really has to worry about ideas like knight to b5 attacking this pawn because the knight's in front of it um and then secondly you can just move your bishop out and attack this way and castle your king you get a lot of development very very quickly yeah um and so i think actually for you this this is probably a i mean a, a better opening choice um so after takes bishop c4 because really black only has a couple of moves they can move the knight they can move the bishop here if they make this check uh you just push the pawn again okay so that's it looks like the similar ponziani except when they take you move the bishop instead of the pawn well you mean the danish is what you what you mean like it because this is the oh, danish yeah. gambit Never mind. no no it's well that's fine it doesn't matter but as long as you recognize that it's it's comparable to something else that you've played that's that's all that really matters um but basically when you put the bishop here it's like you know when you when you do this order your opponent is never is never going to move their bishop to the square they're going to be like no i'm just going to move my knight out and push the pawn in the center so it's it's like you trick your opponent in a sense by putting your bishop here and then if they if they want to get back to that previous position and they move their knight out you you don't go for it at all you just push your pawn to e5 here okay um so i think if they let's let me just think for a second so let's say they go bishop to c5 
you push the pawn um this this already i think is is very very good generally speaking let's just say black moves the knight out you would now push your pawn forward to attack the knight again you, you could take this pawn on d4 here but it's better to push the pawn ahead to e5 yep and um so now again if your opponent is experienced they probably will know that the correct move is to push the pawn forward to d5 but if they are and let's just say they go knight to e4 you actually have a very funny move here which is you can now like move your bishop to d5 okay so that attacks the the knight on e4 mm -hmm. and he can't protect it because if i can i can on um, right so well i mean the the only move black can play is actually pawn here now if you play on passant i can capture with my knight oh yeah no no but that's fine but this this actually is winning even though you're down a pawn here the reason that this position is is much better if not winning is because black can no longer castle the king mm -hmm. you see when, when i push the pawn temporarily you're down a pawn but after you castle your king let's just say i mean you're threatening to capture back let's say takes play knight here takes takes um black really struggles to complete the development because the rook and the bishop here on a8 and c8 are not developed you cannot castle your king here because the bishop stops it um and additionally you have ideas like moving the knight here to create a fork uh towards the queen and the rook you also can maybe move your bishop to g5 as well yeah and this position cool. is already basically lost for black like if black i don't i don't know maybe black can move the queen here uh and now you can move your bishop to g5 let's say black moves the queen and you go like rook to e1 yeah and the reason this position is close to loss here is because black can't develop any anything all his pieces are, are on their more or less original squares and now you can threaten to like push the pawn and open up this uh open up this file towards the black king on e8 does that make some sense yeah no for sure i mean it's, it's open any open position seems a lot simpler in terms of executing the the end game or like finding a way to win yeah so i mean i think like again your opponent maybe if they're really strong they'll know how to play against this but what i would say about like the scotch gambit versus like even the the danish is the scotch gambit is playable top grandmasters play this gambit and it's not it's not like if your opponent knows what they're doing they get a winning position well that's um, good so the actually i think like if you're going to study one of these openings it would make um it, it makes quite a bit of sense to uh, to study scotch gambit okay yeah that's what i'll do because like the ponziani was fun because like at my level a lot of people just fall for traps really early and mm -hmm. they just they give up their like they i just win a knight right right yeah if they like they, they they make the wrong capture like it's probably something like this right it's like um it's probably something like like this or something and you get like how, how does it normally go when you win the knight uh well yeah so basically it ends up being um somehow my queen is attacking on d4 both the knight and the, the king okay okay all right um yeah so i mean th it's it's a good it's a good opening choice I, I do like it but i think actually playing the scotch gambit um this bishop c4 is is much more dangerous and, and a better try uh because it seems to me you like open positions and, and the ponzion is not a bad opening but i will say that a lot of players uh especially where, where you're at they're, they're many in many cases they're going to play something like this yeah and if, you, if you know how to attack it you maybe can get a big advantage but it's very it tends to be a very slow game um and peace and you have to develop your piece and maneuver and it's just it's something that i think is is pretty advanced generally yeah that's what i that's what i started to get to is like you know sure if they fall for the trap right mm -hmm. off the bat i'm okay but otherwise i'm not gonna win <laughs> right exactly yeah so that's why yeah i think like if you play the scotch gambit this makes makes a, a lot of a lot of sense um now you did mention you have some issues with from the black side right um well you know i actually for some reason i generally feel more comfortable with black because my open with i, I kind of like the idea of opens that no matter what they do i get to do what i want to do mm -hmm. so like basically when i set up like a sicilian night or for whatever i make one two three like four first four moves are pretty much automatic mm -hmm. right um now it is it is a very tough opening to play but but do you do you know what the base what the basic themes are of the night orc like mm -hmm. what 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 you're trying like when you push this pawn it's kind of 
kind of objectively it seems a little bit weird right well i mean not, not to me because it's what i do every time <laughs> well it's, right right but do, do, do you know why you push this pawn do you know what the the, yeah. re, what the like, like the actual reason behind it is because I, I i don't allow him to have control of the b5 square and i can push up my pawn. right i mean basically the point is that you want to take space by pushing the pawn the, the main the main reason is that you support the pawn push and let me just make some random moves um uh what are some random moves that aren't actual moves here it's hard to find a move that's not a known move but let me just say put the bishop here and let's just say i i um i put like my queen here for example the thing is it takes a lot of space but also long term there are ideas where you can maybe like let me just push the pawn uh you get a position like this where you can then push this pawn to attack the knight on c3 and um and you know, if if the, once the knight moves away, you can capture this pawn in the center. It's no longer defended. Um, so it's it's really important that uh, the basically you, you have these ideas with like pawn to a. The idea is like to play b5, maybe push the pawn, remove the knight from guarding the pawn at e4, and then secondly, even if you don't get that, let's just say we get some position like this where white has pushed a pawn to guard the center. So like if you push, they move away and the pawn guards. Um, but you can actually develop your bishop. Of just what I that's what I do every time mm -hmm. is that I, I don't push the pawn yet I always move that bishop there in the diagonal and I often win a pawn in the center because a lot of people don't realize that the pawn is vulnerable and not double attack right so so that, that's very very good um I don't know what, what what do most people when you play them do they have like a certain setup that they try to play against us London I mean I, I can't really see the board as well this way Oh, you just uh, you can click on that cog wheel up oh. up on, like at the upper uh, right hand corner of the board. There's like okay, that cog wheel, yeah, and at so, the bottom there's like a two rotating arrow. So, two arrows. so I can go back, right? Yeah. Okay, so they don't always take. By the way, like this mm -hmm. isn't always the move. That's 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 actually typically not what they do. Uh -huh. um, they typically do this. Okay. And then I can All right. go here, mm -hmm. and then they sometimes will do this. And then I go here, and then they might, you know, go here, and then I go here, mm -hmm. and now they move here, and then I, then from here I either um, I move this bishop here, or I'll start to push this pawn up and try to trap the bishop a little more. But I guess what I'm, what I, what it feels good about for me is I'm getting all this space on the right, and I'm just constantly pushing him back. Right, right. Just... And, and and again, you, you, this is definitely playable for white, but it's very hard because it's a closed position. But the difference is, unlike the other one where it's like symmetrical, like I, the, it's not a symmetrical pawn structure here. Like white has pushed this one, whereas you pushed this one. Like if I hit this pawn e five, and you get like the same set of pawns where it's symmetrical. It's very difficult um, to to play. But for black, it's actually really quite easy because the, the first thing you want to do is you want to close the diagonal, so the bishop has no threats towards his weakness on f seven potentially. Um, but then your ideas are very, very easy. So let's just say white pushes the pawn. Uh, where would you put your knight, actually? Which of these squares? Well, it depends. Typically, when that, when my, when the c5 file is open, I move mm -hmm. my knight to d7. So right. that way, I have, uh, then I'm then I'm because then my plan is to move my rook to c c8. Absolutely, that's that's perfect. That's exactly what you want to do. You want, I would say, pretty much, and if when you're playing a Sicilian. Uh, if you if you get this setup, especially where you get the pawns on these these two squares, a6 and b5, and you get like e6, d6, always look to develop the knight to d7 and the rook to c8. Like that's a universal um, universal idea. Yeah. No, this so, is where I'm, like, mm -hmm. I'm in this. This is like when I look at this open, I feel com absolutely comfortable. Where like you know I'm not going to get. There's no like fancy tricks they're going to make me with quick. Um, mm -hmm. It'll be a process, and I mean. Yeah, I just feel comfortable from here because again, like then I'll be able to castle soon and totally protect it on one side and all the space I want on the other side. Exactly. Yeah. And so like in, in an opening like this, normally like a player who's advanced, what they will try to do is they'll try to take the center again, which is they'll play a move like C3. Uh, okay. So let me just make a move like Bishop B7. They'll play like C3, castles, knight D2. Now you move your knight out and I'll put my bishop here. And when you move the rook, I'll put my, push my pawn forward. Yeah, and then here sometimes I move my pawn from uh, to c4. So I don't now that is it. something you don't want to do here, um, and that's the reason that especially you don't want to do this is think about your rook here on the yeah. c8 square. 
Um, if you push this pawn, the rook is not doing anything. There's a pawn in front, but unless white, say, pushes a pawn, there's no way that the um, that the rook is coming into the game here. Yeah, okay. That makes sense, yeah. Because sometimes I get lost in that. I'm like, well, if he wants to trade, I, uh -huh. I usually think that he's doing it because it's, like, something good for him, and I'm like, well, screw you. I don't want to. Yeah, I mean, I think with rooks, it's really important to think, like, e even, for example, like, let me just make, put, put this pawn here. This, this is not really about this position, but it's like, when you put the rooks on these squares, the whole idea is at some point, one of you is going to push in the center and this, this file is going to open up or one of these pawns is going to be very, very weak. So you, when, whenever you're, you're trying to develop the, um, develop the rooks, especially, you always want to be, be aware of, um, of the, the potential for the open file where like you can make a trade and you open it up. Um, but you almost never want to, if you put a rook on, on a file, you almost never want to close, you keep it closed with like a pawn push. So I should just make the change, the exchange. Either there. you make the exchange or you let your opponent make the exchange. But you don't you don't want to decide to close this because what happens is when you close it like this, there's no more stress on the center anymore. So for example, let's just say here you play rook to e8, just, just a random move. Um, and I go queen e2. You can right. now play pawn takes pawn. Oh, wow, because now his bishop is hanging. Uh, yeah, so what white can't take back because then you lose the bishop. And if well, white takes take with the knight, the knight, yeah. What's your move? Well, if he takes there. Mm -hmm. Well then um, what do I have now? I, I guess I no, that's double attack as well. I I'm not sure. Okay, so you can you you the, you're looking at this from the black perspective, right? Yeah. Okay, so the move you can play is just push the pawn. Oh my god, I didn't even see that. See? That's like a winner right there. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, that's, that's just... I mean, again, you're going to end up way ahead in material after you push the pawn. Yeah. So so it's like, if we, if we look at this position and you push the pawn, you'll notice that now when I move the queen, there, there are just no threats at all. My, my This pawn is very, very secure. And what's going to happen, actually, if you do this, is not too different from uh, what we looked at the other way, where this bishop, white's going to push this pawn, and there's going to be a huge threat towards this pawn in h7 here yeah so so that's why like when you have a rook on on a file where they're, they're like pawns like this or, or you know even if even if it was a position you know like like this for example you all you, you don't really want to push the pawn and close it because then your rook is just stuck behind the pawn I so you, okay. you really want to you, you want to you know if there's a situation where you can trade and open it up you want to look at that but even if you don't trade you almost never want to um you know like close close the file you always want to keep the idea alive of opening it up for the rooks because otherwise the rooks end up doing very the rooks can be very very bad here like if you push the pawn and queen here white's rooks are much better because white is the one who can who can open up the center here yeah like white can put the rooks on on um on d1 and e1 and your rook on c8 is, is really bad with the pawn on c4 here um, and it's just like, there, there's just not much you can do. So really do everything you can with the rooks to, to focus on the idea of like having it on an open file. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's that's one thing that's pretty universal is that you want the rooks to be on, on open files. Now, there are gonna be positions that are closed where you can't really do that sometimes, but, but I would say like, at least where you're at, like 90% of the time, there will be an open file and you wanna see if you can get a rook on it. Yeah. Because rooks, I mean, that's where they're they're best placed is is on open files. Yeah. Um. So so yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think is is there is there anything else that you have questions about? Well, I think that's a lot, and I mean, my brain typically works in pieces, and uh, I definitely feel like I'm going to try the Scotch Gambit. Yeah, and I think that's really important. Yeah, because yeah, I definitely feel like you know I don't want to go in with this idea that like if people don't prepare then I have an edge, but if they do, then I'm at a disadvantage, which is kind of what I did with, you know, pog champs. Right, right, no, it's true. I think I think that's why a Scotch Gambit, there are a lot of themes that are very similar. I think, you know, if you play an opening and it's not, I mean, perhaps it works if your opponents make blunders, but if they know what they're doing, don't work. You still want openings that are very similar because you already have certain fundamentals that you've, that you've learned from the other opening. Right. Um, it's like what so. I found is say, for example, with the Sicilian Night Orb, it's like, I played <laughs> this position so many times right that it's just a lot more comfortable when i'm in a spot where i just like know what i'm doing whereas when i'm learning a new opening the way that the pieces end up is like i don't see things as well unless i've done it so many right. times so like my, my most i'm most comfortable and i know I've, I've watched the videos that say like 
I shouldn't be playing the Nidorf because it's way too advanced and stuff, but it's like, I'm so much more comfortable with it um, in terms of like, just all my moves seem easy and, until the, you know, the, the middle part where, you know, you have to figure stuff out. But right. this move, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about the Rook on C1, on C, uh, C8, C8 yeah. that's open. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think, yeah, it's, I, what I would say is that's also why when players are new, you kind of want them to play openings where they can make like the first five to 10 moves without having to really worry that much. Um, because, because if you have to worry at the very, very beginning, you're much more likely to make a mistake because if, if you haven't played a lot of chess, it's like, you don't really understand. It's like, to me, this Bishmon C2, or even, even before with the Bishmon D3, it's very natural and it makes a lot of sense. But if you haven't seen it, then it's like, it's, it's not going to make sense. And especially when you're in, in the opening stage, the first couple of moves, uh, it's just, you're, you're, you're not going to know where to put the pieces. So I actually, I, that makes a lot of sense with Nidorf. And, um, I, I think like this, the idea of just playing a6, b5, and e6 and developing the two bishops, um, they're, they're almost, you can always do that. So I think it's, yeah. it's a great opening choice. The only one that gives me trouble sometimes is a defense mm -hmm. against this. Sometimes is when people play that Alapin thing. Oh, you mean this pawn push? Yeah. And then they get up, then they set up a situation where that queen comes to c2 and somehow I'm just like, what? You know, and it's all attacking my king and I'm like, just, I'm, I'm stuck. Yeah. I think if your opponent plays this, you kind of don't get to have the same setup because in reality, it's not so different than the pawns. Yanni. Why does white push the pawn? Because he's planning on pushing to d4. Right. And white just wants to take the center. It's like the exact same theme, except you push the pawn to c5 instead of e5 here. Um, what I would say, though, is if your opponent plays this, what I would recommend that you play against it is to push this pawn here in the center. Okay. Because you can't really get the same setup that you normally would. So, that helps. Um, because like, yeah. like, I typically just do my setup no matter what, but I realize like, how people react should affect that. And I shouldn't just go from like here to like D6, which is my normal pattern. Right, I, th I think this is the only only variation if they push the pawn where you have to do something different, though. Okay. Otherwise, yeah. I think you can always do that same setup with d6 and a6 and b5 and so forth. Yeah. Um, but if they do play the setup, what I would recommend that you do is you push this pawn here. Okay. White trades. And now let's say white pushes the pawn to d4 here. And what I would recommend that you play is very simple. You develop this knight. So white develops a knight. And now just take the pawn. White takes back. And now you push the pawn to e6. Okay, so it opens. It's an open game, right? And so normally your opponent will probably play knight to c3, and now you move your queen back. And there, there are a couple ways White can play this, but let's just say for argument's sake, they put the bishop on e2. You develop your bishop. Both sides get castled. Let's say White moves the bishop to just e3, for example. Yeah. And so now the the way that you play this, you actually push the pawn to b6 here. Interesting. And the point being that you develop the bishop on this diagonal. I like that. That's I really like having the bishop on that diagonal because at my level, people forget that it's there. And it often allows me to scoop something up that, you know, is unguarded. Right. So that's that's what I would say is I, I think like this this very basic development of um you, you make sure that you if your opponent plays the Alpin, first of all you try to you try to attack the center so white doesn't get a big center with pawns on e4 and d4. And then after that, you just you make sure to trade in the center and finish your development first on the king side before you do anything with the queen side here. Yeah. And then then after that, you can worry about pushing the pawn and developing your bishop and then maybe your knight down the road. But overall, um, I mean, I think this is a pretty good good setup against against this Alpin Sicilian. But it's the only one. The Alpin is the only one where you can't do your regular setup. Everything yeah. else you can always do d6 and a6 and everything like like you Good. like you want to. Excellent. That helps makes it a lot easier. And so, great. okay, great. No, that's good. And then I'll work on the scotch because that's like you said. I mean, after a couple moves, it sort of becomes like the Danish without the danger of them, you know, screwing me with the d4 move. Even though it's still a good move, right? Yeah, it's still a good move, but yeah, you're very. It's very much a game. You're you're not just worse. Normally, if your opponent knows how to play against the Danish, you end up behind by one or two pawns because they can give back a pawn and they're still ahead by a pawn. Whereas yeah. in that one, um, it's it's very balanced. The, the material is the exact same. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any any other questions? Well, I think that's good, man. I, I got. I'm gonna practice the scotch. I'll let you know how it goes. Hopefully, my rating goes back up. <laughs> and, uh, that's great. 
I'll be ready for the Joker's Wild. Yeah, I, I think, you know, what I would say is, again, even even if the results aren't great, there, there always are periods, I feel like, with people when they're improving where it's like they, they don't see it in the rating. But if you keep working at it, there's going to come a time when you when you will just have that sun increase of like 100, 200 ELO points if you're doing doing all these things the right way. So I, I wouldn't really I would try not to get discouraged. Um, also, I, I would say with chess, especially if you're newer, sometimes it is good to not play it every day. Just take a couple days off um, uh, rather than just trying to do it every single day. Yeah. Uh, so the format for the tournament, I don't know if it's fully yet. Like, should I be practicing 10 minute games or? Um, yeah, I think it's going to be 10 minute games. I don't think it's going to be blitz games. Um, it might, it might be, it'll probably be like somewhere between eight to 10 minute games where you get a little bit of time for every single move. Okay, cool. All right. That's, that's comfortable. I, I don't feel rushed yeah. that much. Great. Okay, great. All right. Well, I, I mean, I, I hope you enjoyed that, and I'm sure, I'm sure uh, you'll you'll do well in Joker's Gambit. Really looking forward to it. So you have like nearly a month to get ready. Yeah, I'm definitely like like I've been in a little bit of a chess rut, but you know, having a lesson and like listening to someone like you explain things, um, you know, it, it inspires me to like actually start analyzing my games again. <laughs> that's that's really inspiring. So it's it's great to hear, and I'm just glad that I I can sort of provide that inspiration for you. So uh, that's really nice. Thanks. You got it, man. Well, was, you're a great teacher. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Um, okay, then, yeah, I guess uh, I'll, I'll let you get going. But that, that was that was a lot of fun. And um, I, if you want to do it again before Joker's Gamble, like in a week or two, just let me know and uh, we can set it up again. I'll message you after I give, like, so I'll, I'll put a weekend of uh, Scotch Gambit and let you know how it's going. Great. Perfect. All right. Okay, man. Well, have a good one. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk again soon. All right, bud. Thanks again. All right. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.